Good morning. Welcome to the uh, annual academic conference of Ceylon College of Physicians 2020. Uh, we, are going, we are doing it as, an, as, a, as a virtual conference. We are starting with teaching capsules. Uh, teaching capsule one is done by Professor Umapati Tirunyanam. Um, Professor Umapati Tirunyanam doesn't need much introduction to the college. Uh, he's, he was a resource person to us a few times during the past years. And uh, Professor Umapati Tirunyanam is an associated professor and he's a consultant neurologist. He's MBBA Singapore, FAMS, MRCP United Kingdom. Over to you, Dr. Umapati. Uh, he's doing his uh, teaching capsule on vertigo. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers um, for inviting me uh, again and uh, to give you this talk from the comfort of my, uh, from my flat. Okay, let me uh, share the, uh, the screen. Okay, hopefully it works. Okay, so um, everything okay, sir? Uh, okay, madam. Can you see me? Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see you. Okay, good. So I'll start now. So today's um, <clears throat> one hour session is uh, how I approach patients with vertigo and dizziness. So um, most of what I'm going to be uh, speaking on today would be. Uh, will be available as, um, as, as uh, handouts and notes at this QR code. So I'm going to just leave it on for a few seconds for, for the audience to uh, take a capture of this uh, QR code so that you can download the, uh, the notes later. And, um, and I just would like to request that you respect the uh, privacy of the patients uh, whose videos uh, I'm going to show. Uh, they've kindly agreed for the videos to be shown, um, but do respect their privacy. We are going to share the the videos. Okay, so I'm going to start off uh, straight away with a patient that I just saw just a few days ago. He's a 52 year old man who comes to the emergency department complaining of sudden severe vertigo and he was uh, vomiting almost nonstop. So it was very difficult for us to actually examine him or even take a decent history. And this is what uh, um, you would see if you were to examine his. Uh, examine his eyes. His uh, rest of the neurological exam was uh, quite unremarkable. You know, a quick neurological exam was unremarkable except for uh, examination of the eyes. I'm going to show you some of the features now. Maybe I'll make it a bit bigger so you can see it better. Okay, and I want you guys to all think about, um, I want you to vote uh, internally. You don't have to declare your answers, but if you vote internally, what do you think is the cause for these patients, acute onset of vertigo. So what you can see is that there is a very prominent nystagmus. The nystagmus seems to be predominantly horizontal and it's always beating to the right. It's always beating towards the, the right. Okay, so I'm going to just show it again for those of you who didn't catch the whole thing. Um, you can see that's always beating to the right. There's no change in direction at all. Okay. Can you look over the other side? Okay, the camera, sir. Okay, so I want you guys to uh, make a vote. Okay. Um, just make it smaller. Okay, I want you to uh, vote for a diagnosis. And then later on, we'll see how this approach that I'm going to discuss today, the so-called four question approach to um, tackle dizziness. As, as you all know, dizziness is one of the most feared symptoms of all physicians from all over the world. This has been well established that uh, most doctors don't like to see dizzy patients. So more to um, reassure the physicians that other than anything else, this four question approach will help you uh, reduce stress and allow you to function uh, for, for many years without getting too stressed out by dizzy patients. So let's discuss these four questions and then we'll go back to our patient, okay? So what is the first question that you need to ask? Four questions, right? What's the first question you need to ask? Well, the first question is, is the dizziness a sensation of near fate? Is it a sensation of syncope? Or is it a sensation of vertigo? So what is vertigo? Well, vertigo means there's something wrong with the vestibular system in the peripheries 
or its central connections. And because the vestibular system is responsible for allowing you to sense your position in space, especially when you're moving, when it's abnormal, you get vertigo. So to simply define vertigo would be, it is a sensation, an illusion, it's an illusion of movement that is often rotatory, but it can be a feeling of linear displacement or tilt. That's basically what vertigo is. So if the persons are going to tell you that the predominant complaint they have is not a feeling of faint, but it's a feeling of movement, especially with rotatory, when they are not moving and when their sensation, their sensorium is relatively intact, then we are likely dealing with vertigo. One of the prominent features of vertigo is that it's almost always associated with at least nausea, but most of the time the patients are vomiting profusely. So that is the first question that we need to establish. Then the next question we need to ask is, is the vertigo, as we mentioned before, is due to a pathology in the vestibular system, right? Now, then we have to ask ourselves, is the pathology in the peripheral vestibular system or its central connections? So that is the key second question. To do that, we have a number of sub-questions. The first is obvious to all of us physicians, it's basically to look for associated neurological deficits. So if the pathology is in the central nervous system, obviously the patient is going to have other central nervous system features like drowsiness, double vision, numbness of the face, dysarthria, dysphagia, weakness of the limbs, numbness of the limbs. All these things are quite self-evident for physicians who are listening. Because the vestibular system, if it's abnormal in the central nervous system, it can't be affected. It can be affected in isolation, but more often than not, there's going to be some collateral injury to surrounding structures. So if you go through a checklist of all the cranial nerve symptoms and the limb symptoms, you should be able to discern whether the patient has got peripheral or central pathology. Okay, so that is quite self-evident. So I'm not going to talk much about that. But what I want to add today is some of the additional features that you can look for in these patients to allow you to discern whether is the pathology is in the peripheral vestibular system or in the central vestibular system. To start off with, I'm going to start off um, firstly to discuss the nystagmus that you see. What is the type of nystagmus that you expect if the pathology is in the peripheral vestibular system? And what is the type of nystagmus that you would see if the pathology is in the central nervous system, okay? To do that, some of you who have listened to my talk before know that whenever I approach eye movements, I advocate a, a constructive Lego block-like constructive approach. So let me illustrate that. So in this case, these are the two pairs. This is a pair of eyes, okay, that are looking straight ahead. If I were to give the command for this pair of eyes to look to the left, okay, or look to the right, whichever direction you think you um, want, to, uh, want the eyes to look at. Now, two things must happen. Firstly, the six nucleus must fire through the six nerve and allow the lateral rectus muscles to abduct, abduct. At the same time, the third nucleus must fire and allow the medial rectus to adduct. correct? So then you are able to look to that direction. Now, but there is a problem, minor problem. The third nerve is in the midbrain and the sixth nucleus is in the pons. So it's like two people living on two different floors of an apartment. So what do we need? We need an elevator. We need an elevator that connects the sixth nucleus to the third nucleus. This elevator is called the medial longitudinal fasciculus, okay? So the medial longitudinal fasciculus allows the sixth nucleus to communicate with the third nucleus so that this command to look to this direction is done seamlessly at the same time, simultaneously, without any lag. Okay, so the medial rectus fires and the lateral rectus fires. Okay, now, now in addition to these structures that you see in the diagram, there's one other actor that I need to bring into this drama. And this actor is your ear, your eighth nerve. Okay, so the eighth nerve must be connected to this system. Now, many of you would remember how this is connected, but for the students who are watching, I want to illustrate a very simple approach that will allow you to remember how to connect the eight nucleus to the connections that you see in front of you. For that, you need to look at the screen and look at my face. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to look straight into my camera. So if you look straight at my face now, 
Now, remember, the instruction just now was look to the left or look to the side, right, right? So if I were to look to this direction, my right eye AB ducted and my left eye AD ducted, which means my right six nucleus must be active, correct? Now, now while looking at the camera, okay, while looking at the camera, as you can see, I'm quite a restless person. So if I were to turn my head suddenly towards my left, okay, if I turn my head suddenly towards my left, I'm still looking at you. Notice that I was still looking at you without any effort on my part. And that's because of the, of the pathways that we are just going to discuss. So if you notice now, if I'm looking at you now, if I've turned my head to the left, my right eye is AB ducting and my left eye is AD ducting. So what does that mean? That is very similar to what you see in the slide in front of you, right? The right six nucleus must be active to allow my right eye to AB duct and my left eye to AD duct. So that is the efferent pathway. But where is the efferent signal coming from? Because this time I didn't command my eye. I just moved my head to the left and my eye went in the opposite direction. So this is a reflex. So where is the efferent signal coming from? As you can see, if I move my head to the left, my ears have got semicircular canals within which there are fluids. So when I turn my head fast, the fluid is going to move. Now, if I were to turn my head fast this way, you can see clearly that the momentum is going to be greater, the fluid movement, the momentum within the semicircular canals is going to be greater on which side? It's going to be greater on this side. So straight away, you will know that the left semicircular canal picks up the signal and it's sending a signal to the contralateral six nucleus to abduct my right eye and through the elevator, the medial longitudinal fasciculus to adduct my left eye to effect this case to the opposite movement. This is the vestibular ocular reflex. And this is what I can show you on the picture right in front of you. The contralateral ear is con ipsilateral is connected to the ipsilateral six nucleus to allow this vestibular ocular reflex to work. Okay, and then the same thing will happen when I move my head to the opposite direction. If I move my head to the opposite direction, my left eye is abducting, my right eye is adducting, and which ear gets the greater signal? My right ear gets, gets the greater signal because the momentum is greater in the, in the direction of movement. Okay, so that is the vestibular ocular reflex. Now, in peripheral pathology, Obviously, the pathology is where the lightning is striking in my picture, correct? So now, if you understand this picture that I just, this diagram that I just showed you now, or the, the, uh, the, uh, the actor I was showing you in front of the camera, uh, you will be able to figure out what kind of nystagmus you would expect. So let's just uh, concentrate on my face now. All of you watch my face while I uh, point towards the camera. Now, remember I said, both semicircular canals are full of fluid. And when you move the head left and right, the momentum of the fluid induces a signal in the eighth nerve. When I move to the left side, this one gets greater signal. When I move to the right side, this one gets greater signal, right? So when I move this way, this one shakes more. When I move this way, this one shakes more. So that's how the signals are picked up. But when I'm looking straight at you, both ears are getting only minimal signal, right? Basal signal. So they are firing at basal rate. When I turn my head to the left, this one moves more. When I turn my head to the right, this one moves more. And contralaterally, the eyes will move, okay? But when I'm looking straight ahead, both of them are firing at a basal, very calm, relaxed sort of rate. But if I come now and mischievously damage my eighth nerve, acute vestibulopathy, if I acutely damage this side now, this one from basal rate has become zero. It's dead, right? This side is dead now. But this guy is still firing at basal rate, correct? So if this guy is firing at basal rate and this guy is dead, what will the brain think? This will be a signal equivalent to the head turning to the right, correct? It's almost like as if the head turning to the right. But now actually, and my head is not turning to the right. My head is still looking straight at you. In spite of that, the signal will be perceived by the brain as if my head is turning to the right, right? So what will happen? My eyes will, now what happens when my, turn hits, my head is turned to the right? My eyes move to the opposite direction, right? Through the six nucleus. But now, even though my head is steady, because this guy is dead, this guy is firing at basal rate, my eyes are going to move as if my head is turning to the right. So my eyes are going to drift slowly towards the left. But then at this moment, I am a conscious patient, I'll be very upset. Because I want to look at you through the camera, but my eyes are shifted suddenly to my wall my blank wall here. 
and I don't want to look at the blank wall. So what do I do? I bring it back. I bring it back with that fast saccadic movement. But the moment I bring it back, the imbalance is still there. Imbalance will make my left eye slowly drift back towards the left. Again, I'm looking at the blank wall when I want to look at you. So what do I do? I bring it back again. And then again, the imbalance will allow, will make my eyes move towards the left. Again, I bring it back and the slow movement goes back to the left. I bring it back, slow movement, bring it back to the right, left. I bring it back, slow movement, bring it back to the left. I bring it back and the slow movement, bring it back to the left. What am I showing you now? Slow phase, fast phase. Slow phase, fast phase. Slow phase, fast phase. So this is a nystagmus, a classic peripheral nystagmus. So this is the basis of peripheral nystagmus. Now, once you understand this physiology, it's important to understand it. Then you can understand why this peripheral nystagmus has got a slow phase in this direction, a fast phase in this direction, and all the other key features of peripheral nystagmus. Firstly, you realize now that it's always unidirectional because the pathology is due to one year not working, right? So no matter what I do, the direction of nystagmus has no business to change direction. Always unidirectional, key feature of peripheral nystagmus. The second thing we figured out very elegantly that because of the pathology in one year, the fast phase seems to be the corrective one. So it's always beating away from the pathology. Remember that my left ear was damaged, my right ear, my, my, the direction of the gaze was towards the left, slow phase, and then the correction coming back to the center is always away from the pathology. Again, you don't have to memorize it. You can work it out by just doing this, what I refer to as the vestibular dance. Okay, so fast phase away from the side of pathology. Now you notice that the direction of nystagmus is usually horizontal because the semicircular canals, if you remember from your physiology days, are positioned in this direction. Okay, I'll show you how it looks like. So there is a posterior semicircular canal. I think I'm going to show you in the camera like this. Posterior semicircular canal that points backwards. There is a superior semicircular canal that points upwards. And there's a horizontal semicircular canal that's sideways. Okay, so that the signals are picked up in all direction. So when one side is completely damaged, superior, horizontal, posterior, all gone. Okay, what is left behind on this side is superior, posterior, and horizontal. These three things are unopposed. But if you look at the vectors of these three on the other side, this guy and this guy are almost opposite each other. The superior and posterior is almost opposite each other. So they're going to cancel each other out. What is unopposed is, what is unopposed is the horizontal canal. So you're not surprised that in peripheral nystagmus, the predominant component is horizontal because of the direction of the semicircular canals. So it's unidirectional, no business to change direction, fast phase away from the side of pathology, and it is mixed, usually largely horizontal with a little bit of rotatory component. Now, some of you who are very keen uh, uh, physiologists will understand that the semicircular canals are not truly superior and posterior. They are slightly tilted like that. So therefore, because of the slight angulation, there is a component of rotation to it. It's not completely horizontal. There is a, because some of the, the superior canal goes this way, the posterior canal is not really inferior. It's slightly tilted this way. So these two vectors are not completely canceled out. Okay, so predominantly horizontal with a component of rotation. So therefore you get a mixed horizontal rotatory. The nystagmus is often worse on looking away from the side of pathology. This is known as Alexander's law, which I'm not gonna go through today. And the last one is important. Now, remember all of us as physicians, we have been taught about Romberg sign, right? Romberg sign is a sign of peripheral imbalance in our somatosensory system. So somebody with tabis dorsalis, somebody with uh, B12 deficiency with posterior column dysfunction, or somebody with severe peripheral neuropathy. The person comes and says, doctor, I'm very unsteady, but he seems to be walking quite well. But the moment he closes his eyes, he falls. We call this Romberg sign, right? Because it means there's pathology outside the cerebellum, that the cerebellum is compensating with the vision. So the moment the patient closes the eyes, he falls. We call it Romberg sign, right? But there's also a Romberg sign of the eyes because if there's peripheral nystagmus, the cerebellum is able to use the vision to suppress this nystagmus. 
to suppress this nystagmus. So the moment you take away vision, like Romberg sign, the nystagmus will become more severe. So this is the last point that I want to make. Worse with removal of visual fixation. So let's study all of these with, with a real patient. Okay, I'll make this bigger so you can see better. Okay, so remember, unidirectional nystagmus, no business to change direction, predominantly horizontal with a bit of rotatory component, um, beating away from the side of pathology, and finally, worse when vision is taken away. Okay, let's see all the features of this patient. So you notice there's a right beating mix horizontal, mainly horizontal with a bit of rotation towards the right. That means the pathology is to the left. When he looks straight or when he looks to the opposite direction, it does not change direction. That is the key. But look what happens when he closes his eyes. It becomes even more obvious, right? So this is Romberg sign of the eye. So worse with closure of eyes improves, reduces in intensity when you open his eyes, but faster in, in intensity and amplitude, greater in intensity and amplitude when he closes his eyes. So this is known as Romberg sign of the eye. Now, many of you are wondering, what, the, what, what am I talking about? Because how am I going to see the person's eyes if the eyes are closed? Now, very few patients have eyelids that are thin enough, like this patient, for us to appreciate that. So what do we do? Well, the ENT doctors make a lot of money so they can afford something called frenzel glasses. But we physicians, we don't make that much money, so we have to modify glasses like this. Okay, This is just a very thick magnifying glass that I put over the patient's eyes. And that means that the patient is not able to see, because when you put very thick magnifying glasses in front of a patient's eye, he or she will not be able to see. So I'm removing, I'm removing visual fixation without asking the patient to close the eyes and see what happens. Huh? Okay, without the glasses, hardly any nystagmus. With the glasses, very severe nystagmus. Without the glasses, no nystagmus. With the glasses, prominent nystagmus. So the glasses removes visual fixation and allows the patient, allows the nystagmus to become more obvious. This is another example. No nystagmus at all at primary position, but you put on the glasses, suddenly the nystagmus comes on. This tells you this must be peripheral because this is a Romberg sign of the eye. So, the stem is present, but not very obvious. Now, we take away visual fixation. You can see it nicely, right? So, this is Romberg sign of the eye. Okay? Okay, when you remove the glasses and she can fix it now, the nystagmus dampens. Okay? So, we have gone through the key features of peripheral nystagmus, right? Because we know that Discerning the type of nystagmus will allow us to discern whether the person's vertigo is peripheral or central. So unidirectional fast ways away from side of pathology, mainly horizontal, and worse, worse when visual fixation is removed. Okay. Now, in contradistinction, we have central nystagmus. In central nystagmus, what happens is the patient's nystagmus direction always changes. Okay, he looks to the left, he beats to the left. Looks to the right, it beats to the right. Look up, it beats up. Looks down, it beats down. That's why we call it horizontal gaze evoked or horizontal gaze dependent nystagmus. Okay? So a classic example, this is a lady with spinal cerebellar degeneration. I'll make it bigger for you. Okay? And you can see that unlike the other patient, when you look to the left, it beats to the left. Looks to the right, it will change his mind and start beating to the right. And when she looks up, it will beat up. Okay, so this is classic central. And if you put on the glasses, ask her to close the eyes, whatever you do to a, a visual fixation, the nystagmus doesn't change in intensity. Just like Romberg sign doesn't change in a person with cerebellar disease. A person with cerebellar disease, eyes open or closed, he's still going to fall, right? So the same way the nystagmus of central nature doesn't change with the eyes open or closed. This is another classic example. He's patient with Wernicke's encephalopathy from drinking too much alcohol. And Wernicke's encephalopathy is another classic prototypic central nervous system disorder that presents with all kinds of central nystagmus. So classic horizontal gaze evoked nystagmus. When he looks to the right, it's beating to the right. Okay, now when you look to the left, 
we will start beating towards the towards the left you see so once you see that you know this person has got central pathology okay so we already said how do we differentiate peripheral and central disease well firstly look for associated central nervous system features which is obvious to all of us then we already discussed now okay we spent quite a bit of time how to discern a peripheral nystagmus from a central nystagmus now i'm going to come to the next most important aspect of uh, vertigo management which is the head thrust sign how do you discern the head thrust sign now head thrust is basically a way of this testing the vestibular ocular reflex in an efficient way at the bedside so basically what you're doing is moving the person's head very quickly okay like now okay i'm going to show you okay i'm going to take off my glasses so you can see my eyes better if you look straight i'm going to look straight at the camera when i move my head left i move my head right my eyes are still fixated on you no no break in fixation at all the reason why that is happening is because i've got very normal vestibular system and my vestibular ocular system is working perfectly so when i move my to my left my eyes immediately look, continue looking at you because of the left vestibular system working when i move to the right my right vestibular system is working and my eyes are still fixated on you now if one side is not working what's going to happen is when i move my head fast to the left my eyes will follow my head for a few seconds and then i will realize oh my god i was supposed to be looking at the camera why am i looking at the wall so then i will make a corrective voluntary saccadic movement back to the eye this voluntary movement this voluntary saccadic movement that you need to discern is the basis of the head thrust sign okay because normally if the head thrust sign is working you should be able to do this but if my head my if my vestibular sign if my vestibular system is not working on my left side for example what will happen is when i move to the right my eyes are still fixated on you but when i move to the left what will happen is my eyes will follow my head for a while and then i will realize oh my god i was supposed to be looking at you and then i will do this okay i will do a corrective saccade so look for this corrective saccade when you see this corrective saccade the head thrust is positive that means that that ipsilateral vestibular system is not working so i'll show you again this is normal this is normal this will be what an abnormal uh, head thrust will look like you saw that my head followed i'm i'm pretending eh? my vestibular system is normal but i'm pretending my left vestibular system is not working okay now let's see a real patient and i'm sure all of you will diagnose this patient who has got pathology in the left side okay pathology in the left side so the way to do it is to hold both ears nicely like this support the head and the neck like this with wide spread out fingers move the head slowly so the patient doesn't get scared that you're going to twist the head and kill the patient so move the head slowly first make them feel more reassured then after that you can move the head fast the important thing is to move the head fast short amplitude and don't twist the neck okay just short amplitude but quick speed okay short amplitude but quick speed okay so let's watch what happens okay so first slow movement to make her comfortable that you're not going to kill her then after that move the head. come back to the center again ask her to look at your nose ask her to look at you and to the right normal she's still looking at me now to the abnormal side you saw that she for a few seconds she looks away and then she realized oh my instruction was to look at the doctor and then she voluntarily comes back that is the basis of the head thrust sign so a left in a ear a left vestibular system is not working and that's why a left head thrust is positive so now let's see whether you all can diagnose which side is abnormal in this patient look at my eyes look at my eyes that's instruction given to the patient yes you all can notice that so it is abnormal right here this time right to the left no problem to the right he looks away first and then he catches up looks away and then he catches up looks away and then he catches up right so that is now now this is the most this ladies one is very subtle so see whether you all can pick it up so if you can pick it up then you are fast okay now so that very subtle just a short a small saccadic catch up 
So her right ear is abnormal. You are not surprised because remember we saw her earlier. We saw her earlier and she had nystagmus beating towards the left. Nystagmus beating towards the left. Okay, good. So now we have figured out that for central versus peripheral, first look for associated signs, discern the nystagmus, and then the head thrust sign should be positive in peripheral pathology. And finally, the last thing that I want to talk to you about is Q deviation. So if you sit the patient up like what I'm doing with this patient and look at the patient straight on, you notice that one eye seems to be in slightly up north and one eye is slightly down south. So this vertical misalignment of the visual axis is known as skew deviation. Skew deviation. Skew deviation is a sign of central pathology. Now, I don't have time to talk about the pathophysiology of skew deviation, which is a beautiful thing. One, uh, maybe if you guys can invite me next year, I can talk to you about pathophysiology or skew deviation. But, but for now, it suffice to know that you just get the patient to sit up. And if you notice that at primary position, one eye is looking up, one eye is looking down. Okay, that means there's something wrong with this patient's central nervous system. Okay, so, um, so look at the nystagmus, look for head thrust sign, and look for skew deviation. So now many of you in the audience will know this sounds very familiar to something that we talk about in stroke neurology. In stroke neurology, we talk about the hinge test, the head impulse, the type of nystagmus, and skew deviation to differentiate whether a person who comes to you with acute vertigo, does he have a life-threatening posterior circulation stroke or a non-life-threatening benign disorder called vestibular neuronitis? That is the basis of the HINS test. We will talk quite a bit about this in the next few minutes, not now, okay? Because now I want to introduce to you the third and fourth question. Because so far we have only discussed question number one, which is vertigo or non-vertigo. Question number two, which is how do we discern whether the person has got central nervous system pathology or peripheral nervous system pathology? Then we come to question number three, which is how long, sir or madam, did your vertigo last? Is it lasting a few minutes, very, very short or very, very long? Okay. If the person says it is very, very, very short, then it's likely to be benign positional paroxysmal vertigo. Vestibular neuronitis, on the other hand, last for many, many hours, often one to two days. Posterior circulation, TIA, transient ischemia attack in the posterior circulation, is variable, right? But it's never going to be like, um, um, it can be short or it can be long, right? Similarly, posterior circulation stroke, once it has happened, it will be going on from the beginning until you come to you. Migraine as a form of vertigo will be many, many hours, okay? And likewise, many years disease, the vertigo is many, many hours. Question number four. Question number three, now question number four. Sir, madam, is this episode of vertigo the first ever in your life or is this recurrent episode? If the patient says, doctor, no, 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 I've been having multiple episodes, then we know that it cannot be vestibular neuronitis. Cannot be vestibular neuronitis because vestibular neuronitis is a monophasic, uniphasic, monophasic illness. It never recurs. Okay? If it recurs, something is wrong with the diagnosis. Okay, vestibular neuronitis is a viral inflammation of eighth nerve. You must be very unlucky to have it once in your life. So you shouldn't get it again. Okay, so, but on the other hand, if the patient says, doctor, no, 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 no. I've been having these recurrent spells many, many times. Then we are probably dealing with something like benign positional paroxysmal vertigo. Okay, we may be dealing with the TIA if the duration, if the, if the number of episodes were not very chronic, because we know TIAs are never chronic. If the patient says, doctor, 10 years ago, I had one episode of vertigo. Five years ago, I had another episode of vertigo. Two years ago, I had another episode of vertigo. Two weeks ago, I had another vertigo, episodes of vertigo. Then we know this can't be a TIA because TIAs are never so forgiving. They don't just come and go away and then come back again 10 years later. They either stroke out or disappear. So in the great Miller Fisher from MGH actually came up with an axiom that vertigo that is stereotypic that lasts more than three to six months is not likely to be posterior circulation TIA because TIAs are often either sublimiting or go on to develop a stroke. Okay, so uh, but TIAs can be recurrent, but within a short period of time over the last few weeks, few months, sort of thing. Migraine, on the other hand, is a well-known, uh, well-known disease of recurrent vertigo. 
Okay, so so these are the things. These are the three diagnoses to consider. If the fourth question is answered is yes, no, 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 doctor, this is a recurrent spell. But if the person says no, this is the first episode, only episode, then we have to think about vestibular neuronitis or one of the diseases that are recurrent but happening for the first time when you see the patient. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to put all the four questions together and see how we can solve our patient's problems. If somebody says, doctor, I'm having spinning and I'm vomiting all over you, okay, and the whole room is spinning, okay, that means the first question, answer is vertigo. Then the next question is, doctor, during the time I'm spinning, I have got double vision and my right side is numb and I can't move my right leg. Okay, obviously he's got CNS features. It's recurrent, yes, doctor. It's been happening many times in the last two days. You know, it comes on, goes away, and then I think I'm better. It gets comes on, but the last few hours is continuous, so I decide to come in. It's lasting many hours each time. So clearly, this is a posterior circulation stroke or TIA. This patient needs to be admitted immediately, immediate scanning and treatment for life or limb threatening posterior circulation. TIA or stroke, right? So that's very clear to all of us. Now the more slightly more difficult one. This patient comes and says, doctor, I'm spinning, oh, spinning very, very fast and I'm vomiting all over you, okay? Okay, so I'm having vertigo for sure. But I don't have any double vision. I don't have any numbness of the face. I don't have any facial asymmetry. I don't have any limb weakness. I don't have any limb numbness. I'm not dysarthric, I'm not dysphagic. So I don't have any central nervous system features. This is the first episode ever in my life. You know, I'm 54 years old and I've never had any of these spells before. And it's lasting hours. It started about 7 p.m. last night. Now it's 7 a.m. Um, in Sri Lankan time. And it's lasting last 12 hours and it's continuous. So what are the possibilities? Well, one of the common biases many doctors or most of us have is to assume when you don't have evidence to assume either the worst possible disease or you could be biased the other way and worse, assume the worst, the least uh, uh, serious disease. But you realize here, we have answered the first question, we have answered the third question, we've answered the fourth question, but we haven't answered the second question. So we have to keep an open mind. So a vertigo that is first episode lasting many hours, if it is a peripheral pathology, it must be vestibular neuronitis. But on the other hand, if it's a central nervous system pathology, we are dealing with a posterior circulation stroke, either a cerebellar or brainstem stroke. So this is where our famous hints comes in, okay? This is a beautiful study that was done about 10 years ago by Newman Toker and his team from Johns Hopkins and has become entrenched now in the stroke literature. That when a person comes to you with this kind of story, okay, and you're not able to discern an acute vestibular syndrome from a benign peripheral pathology like vestibular neuronitis from a serious disorder, like posterior circulation stroke, then it's mandatory for you to apply the hints that we already talked about. Do the head impulse, okay? Do the head impulse. Oh, somebody's drawing on my, on my thing. <laughs> I'm not sure why they're drawing on my thing. Okay, do the head impulse, okay? Then discern whether the nystagmus is a peripheral or central nature. Let's revise now. What is peripheral nystagmus? Unidirectional, non-direction changing. Okay, mix horizontal, rotatory beating away from the side of pathology and worse with removal of visual fixation. Okay, while central is direction changing. Look to the left, beats to the left. Look up, beats up. Look right, beats right. Okay, and then finally, if one eye is up, one eye is down, skew deviation. So if somebody has comes to you with this story, comes to you with this story and has got negative head impulse, head impulse is negative. Nystagmus is of a central nature and the skew deviation. This study says that there is more than 95% certainty, more than 95% certainty that we are dealing with a posterior circulation stroke. And you know what is the most amazing part? It is even more accurate than the MRI. Okay, an acute MRI could miss a, a small lesion in the medulla, a small lesion in the posterior circulation, but the hints will tell you the answer. So, especially in, in our context where we are live, working in under-resourced parts of the world, we, this is particularly beautiful because we don't have to pay money to their, to Siemens and Philips and all these people, capitalists who are making a lot of money from our patients and rely on clinical skills, okay? So, head impulse, negative, nystagmus, central nature, skewed deviation positive, this patient has a stroke, okay? You admit the patient and treat the patient. 
So another way of looking at it, because this is uh, such important in, in stroke neurology, is a different acronym, same concept, infarct. Impulse negative, hit impulse negative. Fast phase alternating, which means the fast phase of the nystagmus is beating in the direction of gaze. Okay, this is central, right? And skewed deviation present. Okay, so that is the basis of infarct. If this is present, this patient has got infarct. So if you prefer this acronym, because it allows you to uh, remember when a patient has a stroke, please remember this acronym, infarct. Okay, so with that, let's go and look at our patient. Remember our patient, most of you have voted. Let's see how good or how bad we were in making the diagnosis. This is, a, of course, I'll give you a bit more story now because the patient, when he gets better, he is able to give you a bit more story. He's a 52-year-old man with no significant uh, vascular risk factors, comes to you with sudden severe vertigo and was vomiting all over us, right? Remember, we saw him at the beginning of the talk, okay? So we apply the four questions now. So for sure it's vertigo because he was spinning crazy, spinning, 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 and he was vomiting all over the bed. In fact, he, he dirtied all our clothes or so, right? So definite vertigo. So no doubt about it. Not syncopal, right? So I've taken away syncopal from the, from the, uh, so it's not syncopal, it's vertigo. Okay. Central features. Okay. Then when we, when he calmed down, we asked him and he said, no, actually doctor, you, now that you asked me, actually I had a bit of leg numbness and leg arm numbness when this spinning started. And then when we asked him, no, I know you're feeling very uncomfortable, but please answer this question. Very important. Did you ever have this numbness before? He said, no, 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 doctor. This came on at the same time as the vertigo. So clearly he has central features, right? Clearly he has central features. Is this the first episode? Yes. First episode ever in his life. In fact, he has never been admitted to a hospital. Is it long duration? Yes, doctor. From yesterday, 7 p.m. all the way to the now, to now when I'm come to, coming to see you, I've been spinning, spinning, spinning all over. Please help me. Okay. So with this, what's your diagnosis? Well, clearly, posterior circulation stroke. Correct. Because he had numbness associated with vertigo. But why is the nystagmus looking so weird? Many of you would have thought this nystagmus was classic for peripheral nystagmus. So I don't blame you for thinking that this is a peripheral pathology because his nystagmus is predominantly horizontal, always beating towards the right. Did you see that? It's always beating towards the right, never changes direction. When he looks up, also beats to the right. Looks down, also beats to the right. So it looks very much like a peripheral nystagmus. And then because he was so sick, we couldn't sit him up to do the head thrust properly. So I had to modify it. But you notice head thrust is negative. Oh my God, head thrust is negative. So if this was indeed, if this was indeed a peripheral nystagmus, how come the head thrust is negative? Okay, so we went on to examine the patient a bit more. And the many astute clinicians in the audience will notice that there's something else wrong with his eyes. He's got very mild. What does he have? Very mild. Okay, I'll show you in a while. Very mild ptosis and meiosis. You see this eye is bigger. This pupil is bigger. This is smaller. So he's got mild ptosis and, and meiosis. Now many of you will be thinking, oh, I'm, I'm confabulating the signs here. What ptosis am I talking about? So to convince you, I'm going to show you a still of this patient, a still of this patient, okay? So you can see here, meiosis, all of you saw, right? But you notice that there's mild ptosis of the other eye, but what interestingly he has, he has the other sign of Horner's syndrome, which is reverse ptosis. Not only is the upper eyelid coming down, but the lower eyelid is going up. Can you see that? The upper eyelid is here. Now this is his normal eye. This is upper eyelid, lower eyelid. You see the amount of white that can be seen? But you look at the amount of white that can be seen here, right? So clearly the upper eyelid is coming down and the lower eyelid is going up. So this man has got ptosis, enonthalmus, smaller eye, reverse ptosis, and meiosis. So he's got Horner's syndrome. Horner's syndrome in the context of vertigo, central nervous system again, right? So then we went on to examine him further and he realized that not only does he complain of arm numbness, but his cornea reflex is also reduced on the, he blinks very well on the right, but hardly blinks when we touch his cornea on the left. So cornea reflex is absent on the left. So, so 
Then we went on to examine his limbs and we found very exciting findings. Not only is he numb on the left arm and the left leg, but the normal side was also not normal. What was wrong with the normal side? Let's play the video and let's listen to him. Huh? When I touch his left side, he can't feel very well. But here, okay, he can't feel very well on the left side. But on his body, the left side, which is numb, yes, he's feeling the temperature very well. Left side is colder. So this is less cold. But he's not able to feel coldness on the right side. The normal side is not feeling coldness. He's not feeling coldness on the right side. So in other words, the left side that is numb, we are turn this off. The left side that is numb is feeling temperature very well. The normal right side is not feeling temperature very well. So he's got spinothalamic loss on this side. Pyramidal uh, position sense and uh, fine touch loss on the left side, left facial numbness. Okay, so if you put all this together, okay, and of course there's one more sign. We went on to examine his limbs, his upper limb examination didn't show much dysmetria, but if you look at his legs, he's got positive heel shin test on the left side. So he's got mild, subtle cerebellar signs on the left side. So if you take the anatomy of the pyramid, of the medulla now, okay? His vestibular nucleus is affected. Vestibular nucleus is affected. Therefore, he's got very prominent nystagmus. And this nystagmus is mimicking, mimicking peripheral nystagmus because the nucleus of the eighth nerve itself is affected, okay? His trigeminal track of the fifth nerve is affected. Therefore, his cornea reflex is gone, okay? His spinothalamic coming from the opposite direction is affected. And therefore, his right side spinothalamic sensation is lost. His, his cerebellar tract on the left side is affected, so he's got mild cerebellar signs on this side. But fortunately, or fortunately for him, but unfortunately for the doctors who saw him, he was not having dysarthria and dysphagia, so it was more difficult because normally in lateral modality syndrome, they often have dysarthria and dysphagia. So he would uh, easier to make a diagnosis of stroke, but he didn't have dysarthria and dysphagia. So in other words, he had a partial left lateral medullary syndrome. And that was revealed because his head impulse was negative. Okay. His, uh, although his nystagmus was peripheral in nature, the presence of a positive, uh, the presence of an absent head thrust, head impulse was negative and the presence of other subtle central nervous system features. I forgot to mention to you, the sympathetic fibers are here, right? So the sympathetic fibers, the spinothalamic fibers, the trigeminal fifth nerve involvement, the cerebellar involvement here, all these are central nervous system features. Subtle in this patient, but the presence of central nervous system features, the absence of a head thrust sign, even though the nystagmus looked a bit peripheral, made us diagnose this patient to have a lateral medullary syndrome, so we started this patient on medications for a stroke and then su subsequently the MRI brain was done. This is a, not a very good picture, but you can see this is the medulla. You can see a small infarct on the lateral aspect of the medulla and not unexpectedly, the vertebral artery on the same side is slightly irregular. The radiologist feels there may be a small dissection here that has caused this uh, stroke in this patient. Then we went back to look at this patient again. And of course, there are other interesting signs Okay, besides, uh, besides uh, for the neurologists in the audience, one of the interesting signs in lateral medullary syndrome is this sign called the lateral pulsion sign. So for the neurologists in the audience, I thought I will entertain them with this additional sign. You can see that when he closes his eyes, his eyes drift towards the, dr drifts towards the opposite direction because of the imbalance. You know, just like the body imbalance, the eyes drift. Away. So this is known as lateral pulsion. Okay, so when he opens his eyes, the eyes shoot, shoots back because the eyes are drifted back to the opposite direction. So you can see when he closes his eyes, the eyes go to this direction. When he opens his eyes, it comes back. Okay, so this is known as lateral pulse. Okay, one more example. Okay, another lady comes to you with, uh, she's 55 years old, comes to your emergency department complaining of severe vertigo, severe vertigo and dizziness. Okay, and the vertigo is spinning in nature. So question number one, vertigo. Number two, no central or peripheral features. No, uh, unlike the earlier patient we saw, no numbness, 
no Horner syndrome, no cerebellar signs, no dissociated temperature sensation. So absolutely nothing to help you. Okay. Hand and nystagmus is classically peripheral in nature. Classically peripheral in nature, meaning it is always beating in the left with no direction changing. Okay. She has got abnormal, she's got abnormal head impulse test. So when you move the head impulse, the head impulse is abnormal. She's got positive head impulse. Okay. And she has got no, she has got no skew deviation. She's got no skew deviation. So in summary, head, head impulse is present. Her nystagmus is peripheral in nature. She's got no skew deviation. She's got absolutely no central nervous system features, no harness syndrome, no uh, numbness of the face, no cerebellar signs, nothing. This lady has acute vestibular neuronitis. Okay, so you can be more than 95% certain that this lady doesn't have a stroke. She has acute vestibular neuronitis, and you can manage her without the need for a, a without the need for an MRI. Okay, because her head impulse was positive, and nystagmus are so classically peripheral, but and, and she had no skew deviation. As opposed to the earlier patient where the head impulse was negative, nystagmus was and looked like peripheral in nature, but he had other central nervous system features. So straight away that tells you, even without the scans, that that patient has got central nervous system. So that's why this particular algorithm is tremendously useful, especially if you are a stroke doctor, because you need to decide within the next four and a half hours whether the person has got a stroke or not, so that you can effect adequate treatment for the patient. Okay, let's move on to other uh, scenarios. A person who comes to you with vertigo, he's got no central or peripheral nervous system features, absolutely no central nervous system features, but it's very, very recurrent many, many times over the last 10 years. Okay, and each time is very, very, very short spells. And it's been going on for the last 10 years. And we know that TIAs don't go last for 10 years, right? So this must be BPPV. Okay, and how do you diagnose BPPV? You do the Dix Hall Pike test. Okay, the Dix Hall Pike test, as this doctor is trying to do. So you don't need this expensive frontal glasses to do it. But basically, when you do the Dix Hall Pike test, you get the classic up beating, eyebrow beating nystagmus that comes on after a few minutes. Okay, that disappears after a few minutes. That's a dick sulfide test. Okay, now there are other forms of benign positional paroxysmal vertigo. For example, there is a, there is a horizontal form of uh, benign positional paroxysmal vertigo, which, which is very use, very important for the neurologist in the audience to know about. So this is a patient where we diagnose horizontal canal PPPV by doing the supine head roll test. Okay, as you can see in this patient, you can see it's uh, mainly a horizontal nystagmus that comes on and moving the head in left and right direction, okay? Now, all these benign positional paroxysmal vertigo has got beautiful physical maneuvers to correct them. So for BPPV, we correct them. For posterior canal BPPV, we do the Apley maneuver, which is what Dr. Z is doing here, okay? The Apley maneuver, which cures the patient immediately, okay? For the horizontal canal BPPV, we do something called the Guffoni maneuver. Now, why am I not talking about all these things in detail? Because there's so much of information in the internet now. So I've referenced all these maneuvers. The Apley maneuver, the Guffoni maneuver, the Dix Hallpike maneuver, the Supine Head Roll maneuver, all of it is in my notes. So please look up all these videos in YouTube, beautifully uh, demonstrated for you to learn and practice and do on your patient so that you can make a diagnosis of BPPV in this patient. But more importantly, you can cure these patients of their symptoms immediately at the bedside. There are very few times, as you know, neurologists are quite useless at curing patients, right? So there are very few times when we can actually cure patients. BPP is a very, uh, is a, maybe there are only a few instances where we actually truly cure the patient. So we shouldn't lose this opportunity and, uh, and uh, rejoice in this opportunity to cure patients. Finally, if somebody comes to you and says, doctor, I'm spinning like this, but each time it's not short. It's many, 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 many hours. Okay, and it's been going on since I was 16 years of age, and now I'm 54 years of age. So it's been going on for the last 40 years or so, and each time it lasts many hours. What is the diagnosis? Migraine. Okay, now this is terribly underappreciated by the community physicians. Many physicians don't manage migraine very well, they don't diagnose migraine very well, let alone when it comes with recurrent headaches, but even more so when it's when the key manifestation is recurrent vertigo. Okay, 
So as you can see, the headache society has clearly come up with position statements that a person who has got typical migraine is entitled to have headache and spinning and vomiting. But sometimes the headache doesn't come, but it just comes with recurrent vertigo. So in fact, the commonest cause of recurrent vertigo in a young patient is almost always migraine. Okay, so don't underdiagnose migraine because if you treat the migraine well with prophylactic medication, just like you will do for your migraine headaches, okay, these patients get better. Okay, now finally, what do we do with patients with chronic sense of disequilibrium? There are three things you need to remember. One, remember bilateral vestibular toxicity. That's difficult to diagnose. Many of you in the audience are, are very senior physicians who deal with many of these patients. So, and we use a lot of aminoglycosides, especially um, nowadays we use a lot of amikacin for patients with peritoneal dialysis related uh, infection. So remember that your gentamicin level, your amikacin level predicts kidney injury, but does not predict autotoxicity, okay? So in a patient who has been exposed to large amounts of gentamicin, aminoglycosides, amikacins, you must be aware that they can develop bilateral vestibular dysfunction and complain of chronic disequilibrium. Okay, the second most common reason why patients complain of chronic disequilibrium is that they are given too much of vestibular sedatives for non-specific complaints. So Stamatil, Mexalon, Metaclopramide, uh, Cinarizin, Beta Histidine, all these drugs that doctors love to give. When you give too much of it, what happens is that the vestibular systems get so suppressed that it's not functioning anymore. So they develop chronic vestibular toxicity so many patients with migraine, many patients with anxiety neurosis are wrongly given large amounts of vestibular tox, uh, sedatives for long periods of time and end up with no vestibular system and therefore they get into a lot of problems, okay? Finally, consider anxiety and psychosocial factors as a cause. For example, this patient who, who, who was an army recruit, okay, he continuously con complains of disequilibrium, whether he's sitting, standing, or moving, okay? So obviously his vestibular examination was completely normal. He has got no bilateral vestibular or unilateral vestibular toxicity. He's got no central nervous system features, but because of his anxiety related to his military service, he presents with chronic disequilibrium. So all of us know now if there is a movement towards making positive functional diagnosis. So this is a positive diagnosis of a functional neurological disorder. So he should be managed with psychobehavioral management so that he will get out of this problem. Okay, so, and these patients must not be given vestibular sedations because if you give them vestibular sedative, instead of having a normal vestibular system, they end up with abnormal vestibular system and they will end up with real pathology. Vestibular exercises are very useful for these patients. Very quickly, in the last five minutes, I'm going to cover what if the first question was answered as not vertigo, but as syncope. Why do I take such, such a short period? Because most of you are senior physicians in the audience know this very well, because when a person comes to you and says it's a sensation of syncope, it means that for some reason, there is transient hypoperfusion of the brain. Transient hypoperfusion of the brain. Why should there be transient hypoperfusion of the brain? Well, if you look at it systematically, there can only be a few reasons. There can only be a few reasons, okay? It could be something wrong with the heart itself, okay? That is not pumping blood to the brain for a few minutes, okay? What are the problems in the heart? Okay, for example, the person could have an arrhythmia, could have a heart block, could have a Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, or it could have an outflow problem like aortic stenosis in elderly patients. They can come and tell you that they are feeling syncopal every time they exercise. In young patients, when they're exercising, when they're exercising or they are playing games, they suddenly have a fainting sort of spell. They could have hokum. Okay, so think about cardiac causes. Now, once you've ruled out cardiac causes, the next thing to think about is something is wrong with the blood itself. The pump is normal, but the blood itself is abnormal. And we know it is all beautiful general medical problems, right? Anemia, polycythemia, hyponatremia, hypoglycemia, hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia, sepsis, many reasons why a person can come to you with non-specific, non-vertiginous syncopal dizziness because there's something wrong with the blood, including anemia, right? Okay, now if the pump is normal, the blood is normal, maybe something is wrong with the pressure, the pressure that's transmitting the blood to the brain. So this could be either ongoing hypotension or it could be orthostatic hypotension. 
And for orthostatic hypertension, you have many causes, whether it's dehydration, drug induced, autonomic dysfunction, and all these things, right? Now, finally, when um, if, if we have gone through all of this, the blood pump is normal, the blood is normal, the blood pressure is normal, perhaps it is the blood vessels that are abnormal. Now, this is not common because, as you know, blood vessel abnormalities often present with TIA. Okay? They don't present with a syncopal episode because we have four blood vessels to the brain, two carotid arteries and two vertebral arteries, and they, they, they join together to form a circus, right? A circle of villas, right? So, therefore, very rarely do they present with syncope. But occasionally, you get a patient in the posterior circulation, you know, the basal artery is thrombosed and they get a sudden syncopal episode. So, do consider TIA. Now, once you have considered all of this, you've thought about the heart, you thought about the blood, you thought about the pressures, you thought about the blood vessels, then finally you have to start thinking, could this be a benign, a benign form of, of syncope? So this is what we refer to as basovagal neurogenic syncope. So this is also very well known to general physicians. These are patients who all their life are very prone to fainting spells. So this is not a pathology. This is actually a reflex. The reflex that makes them, for whatever reason, some kind of noxious stimulus makes their heart rate goes down and their blood pressure to drop and they faint. Okay. And most of us believe that this is actually a phylogenetic remnant of the play date phenomenon. So those of you who are interested in this, you can go back and read. Animals, for animals, this is an important reflex because it allows them to escape from a predator, this play date phenomenon. But for humans, it's a nuisance because our heart is below the brain. So even when the stimulus is not noxious and life-threatening, we tend to fail. So vasovagal syncope is not a disease. It is a normal reflex. So in summary, okay? So I'm just uh, 10.32 now. I'm going to finish now. Okay, so four questions. Ask yourself, is the dizziness vertigo or syncope? Okay, if it's vertigo, Okay, ask yourself, are there any central nervous system features? In the case that we illustrated, the patient has central nervous system features. So clearly, the patient has got central nervous system disease. But if he doesn't have central nervous system features, go and look at the HINTF. Head impulse, nystagmus, and skew deviation. This gives you additional tool to decide whether, with more than 95% certainty, whether we are dealing with central nervous system pathology or peripheral nervous system pathology. Okay, then ask yourself, how long is the vertigo spell? If the episodes are very long, okay, they're likely to be vestibular neuronitis or stroke or migraine. If they're very short, they're likely to be PPPD. And are they recurrent or uniphasic? Because stroke, TIAs and migraine and PPPD are recurrent, but vestibular neuronitis is uniphasic. So with that, you should be able to answer all your questions. Okay, and I hope these four questions will allow, maybe it won't allow your patients to live longer, but hopefully, will allow you to live longer without too much stress when you see patients with dizziness. If you want uh, slides of my uh, presentation, you can get it from this QR code. And for more information, you can go to this. Thank you very much. And I stop here. Sorry, I went three minutes past time. So sorry. Okay, so... Oh, now I can hear you. Can you hear? Yes, now I can hear you now. Very well. There's a one question. How do you explain the left-sided numbness in the left lateral medial syndrome patient you described? No, I was hoping nobody would ask me that question. <laughs> That's a good... Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure, but I'm thinking if I can share screen again. Um, uh, I'm going to share screen again and go back to that video. I was hoping nobody would ask me that question because I'm not sure how to explain it also. But one possible theory is that if you look carefully at this picture, okay, let's uh, let's superimpose this MRI uh, on this, okay? Now, 
If you look at this, um, oops, wait one second now. Okay, if you look at this MRI here, okay, now the lesion is on the lateral medulla, right? But in the medial part, the central medial part is kind of touching the central part, isn't it? Okay, Let's see whether I can superimpose it on this, then we can put it here. Okay, good. So it's kind of superimposing on the central part. Now, our original theory was that this patient has got a lesion here, right? Now, if I were to extend this a little bit more to involve this, oops, and this is the medial meniscus, right? This is the medial meniscus, right? So it perhaps could explain, it could explain why this patient has got left-sided numbers. I'm not sure. Okay, now part of the reason is probably because, uh, yeah, yeah, I think I th that's how I'll explain it, that, that possibly there's some involvement of the, of, of the medial meniscus in the medial aspect, but then you would ask me how come uh, for his, his, the medial aspect of other parts, but you can see in the MRI, it's such an odd looking lesion that's only involving the medial part of the central part of the medulla, but somehow spared the areas that control the, the swallowing in speech, somehow spared the pyramidal fibers. So I think that's why he has got an unusual pattern of uh, numbness of the same side, but spinothalamic loss on the opposite side. Uh, but I'm honestly speaking, I'm not sure. This is by explanation. So I'll be open to any discussion, any other suggestions from the audience, especially uh, the senior. I know there are many senior expert physicians in, uh, in Sri Lanka. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Mapati. So we are going to conclude our first teaching uh, capsule today. Uh, thank you very no. much. Again.